So any questions before we move on to web security? There's certainly lots, of, I mean, there's a whole course that could be done just in this low level security stuff. To some extent, Bart Miller's software security course is a whole course on that material. Um, okay, so we're now starting sort of the third section of the course. We started with operating system security. We then talked about low level code security. We're now gonna be looking at web security issues um, for a couple of days. So we're gonna do a little bit of review of sort of basic web protocols, what the requests look like, what the sort of threat model is. We'll talk about how browsers implement security policies, what the issues are in browsers. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the security of cookies and how you uh, connect and authenticate the web servers. Okay, so World Wide Web is this great protocol uh, system come out, uh, what, 30, almost 30 years ago. Um, and it was really popularized by the Mosaic web browser developed at UIUC by Mark Andreessen. This was sort of a, you know, the first real GUI browser that ran on popular computers like Windows machines um, and sort of made the web a thing. And in 1994, the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, was created to sort of standardize web protocols. Um, and one of the biggest issues that has always come up from the beginning is balancing security with backwards compatibility. Because like everything out there, when the web was started, security wasn't really thought about as an issue at all. And then gradually people started thinking about it. And so there's a question of how do you add security in without breaking existing websites? And it's an issue because this is a big distributed system with that millions of clients connecting to web servers, millions of web servers serving data. You can't update all web servers and all clients at the same time if there's a security breach. So how do you roll out new features so that you know, clients can still get to see their dancing frogs or get to Facebook while, be, while still being secure, even if the things Facebook is doing is not very secure. So a lot of it is really a study in, given a flawed system, how do we patch security on top of it? Um, there's, there's not a whole lot of, let's start from the ground up and design things to be secure. So one thing to know is that the web is not just HTTP and HTML, probably all of you know that, but there's a whole host of different, of different technologies and protocols. And what this means is that if we're thinking about web security, we need to sort of think of it separately about every single thing the web does, every single thing a browser can do, and how we secure those particular things. We need to think about all the different pieces of software that are used in building a web server, whether it's the web server itself, whether it's the backend database like MySQL or um, SQL Server. We need to think about sort of programming frameworks like Ruby and Django that are in the middle and think about how all these things have to combine to create security. So with any sort of system, we need to think about what the threat model is. So the threat model we have here is that there is a user and there might be multiple users on a machine connecting someplace. There might be a single user who has multiple windows open connecting to different places. They are trying to connect through the internet um, to some website, bank.com here. They might have a browser with lots of tabs talking to multiple different uh, websites at the same time. So on the internet, we have sort of two kinds of threats. One, we have a malicious web server, attacker.com, and we are trying to uh, do a couple of things. You know, we would like to get the user to try to, to connect to attacker.com. Uh, because then we can start interacting with the user. Second, we would like the user to send secret information to attacker.com. Passwords, bank account numbers, money, you know, anything we can, we want the user to send that to attacker.com. Or we want attacker.com to be able to go to bank.com and directly fetch that information for a particular user. The other thing we have to worry about is that there could be an attacker in the network who can sell the traffic going by. So it might be that somebody's sitting in a coffee shop and they're snooping on Wi-Fi and they're just looking at all the packets as they go by and looking for interesting things. It might be somebody you know, at a telecom who or it might be the NSA working at AT&T who can see all the traffic that, you know, the terabytes of traffic that traverses AT&T every day. So these are all examples of attackers that we're worried about. Um, okay. So the common protocol that we use to sort of fetch information, this is really a, a way to get information. 
and to send information. It's sort of like an RPC. We send a request, we get some data back. We send another request, we get some data back. It's called HTTP. So there's a couple of important pieces from this. The first is we have this protocol at the front that could be HTTP or HTTPS for secure HTTP. We then have a host name, which is a DNS, typically a DNS name that we translate using DNS. We have a port number, which defaults to port 80, but you can change it to be something else. Um, we then have some path. In this case, it's calendar slash render.php. So historically, this was, you know, the path in the file system storing your HTML files. We then have a question mark that says that's the end of the path. After this, we have a bunch of parameters, sort of key equals value. Um, we can then have more parameters by putting an ampersand between them. And we can put a hash mark in there if you want to have a bookmark to jump to someplace within a page. So there's lots of things in this URL, and it's great because there's lots of ways to sort of attack the URL through all these different components. The other thing to note is that uh, we only get ASCII characters in here which is great for the US. It's really bad if you speak a language that um, doesn't use ASCII. So if you're Russian, this isn't so great. If you're Chinese, it might not be so great um, if you're stuck using uh, Roman characters for everything. So the protocol itself is great for humans because it's a rare protocol that is all text. There's nothing sort of binary in the protocol itself typically. It's sort of designed for humans to read and humans to type. So in the request, the first word is the method. What are we trying to do? Which is typically get to fetch something or post if we want to upload some data and get a response. We then have the URL we're trying to access and we have the version of the protocol. So one thing you will see is that all good protocols have a version number which lets you update the protocol and add new features to it. Um, we then have some headers that sort of say what are the capabilities of the browser. Because, for example, if the browser is a text, a mobile browser, you don't want to send you know, certain kinds of, of content. So you can say what kind of, um, what kind of data you'll accept, um, what kinds of images you can display. You can say what language you are so that things are localized appropriately. Um, so user agent down there says exactly what browser you're running. This is a very old example because it's Mozilla 1.2.2 from like 1997. So danger of reusing slides. Um, the other thing that's in there is the host name. So even though we're connecting, we had a host name uh, that we entered in the URL, the host name goes in the protocol. And the reason this is important is because you can have a single web server and a single IP address that is serving data for hundreds of different hosts. So um, that's why you put the host name in the protocol and then the web server when it gets this will say, well, for example.com, index.html means this thing, for mic.com it means something else. Um, so this it makes it more flexible than having to just have a single IP address per DNS name. And then we have refer here which says what web page did you come from? If you clicked on a link, what was the URL of the web page you came from? Which is a handy way to sort of spy on the user and figure out what they were doing. So then at the end there's some, uh, there's a blank line and if you're doing a get there's no data. If you're doing a post you can provide some data that you want to upload. So there's a general rule that get requests are supposed to not have side effects on the server. You're not supposed to like, uh, you know, buy something doing a get request, whereas a post uh, call can have side effects. It's, it's a soft rule, but it's sort of a general rule. And it's nice because it says like a get, you know, you can replay it a bunch of times and bad things don't happen. If you replay a post, you might buy lots of copies of your book or something like that. So the response is pretty similar. I'm not gonna go through it in the same level of detail. Um, but it's got a, a version number, it has a response code that sort of says what happened, it's got a phrase, so humans, you can display something to humans about what happened, um, and then it's got a bunch of information about the server. <coughs> um, one thing to note <coughs> is that servers can set cookies, we'll talk about cookies later, this is data that's stored on the client, um, and then at the end you have the length of the content, and then you actually have the content that you're sending. So. Uh, a fairly simple protocol here. Any questions about HTTP basics? No. Okay. Uh, so, the basic way a browser works is that you're going to have some number of windows open or tabs open, and they're all more or less, should be sort of more or less independent. And for each window or tab, the browser is going to take the URL. It's going to go fetch it using HTTP. 
It'll then try to render it, so it's going to have some rendering engine, which is going to process the HTTP and use that as a guide of what it should do. So HTTP will typically have JavaScript code in it that tells it what to do, so it's going to have to run that JavaScript code. Um, there might be instructions to fetch images or something, so it's going to go fetch additional content. The scripting code might cause it to go load extra things. So when it's running it, it'll be doing lots of additional requests to actually um, render the page. At some point, and it's right, you can't actually tell precisely, the page is more or less done running and ready for user input. Um, we actually interviewed somebody last year whose research, he spent two years studying, how do you know when a web page is loaded? Um, like, how do you know when you can click anywhere on the web page and it will actually respond to you? Because a lot of times the web page is drawn, but you can't click on things quite yet. Um, and then once the web page is there, the next job of the browser is to let you interact with it. So it will detect when you click on things um, or when you move your mouse around, and then it will uh, either do default actions, you know, whatever normal thing you do when you click on a link, like load it, or it'll run JavaScript in response. So there will be user actions that the browser will detect, like clicking or mousing over something. Um, and you know, there's timers you can add to this. So you basically have a whole program running on each web page um, at least one program running on each web page that is sort of deciding what to do. And the program is a mix of the browser itself and the default actions it does and the JavaScript code embedded in the page and what the page itself wants to do. Okay. So there is one particular part of the document object model is called the browser object model. And this is really sort of a model of what is drawn on the screen. So the DOM was really what is in the, what is the content you downloaded. The BOM is what are you displaying. So you've got sort of the um, window. Within the window, you can have a frame, which is a sub-piece of the window. You also, um, because you can have sort of nested content, you want to know who your parent frame is. So you might, be draw, you might be a piece of content on a small rectangle, and there's a bigger rectangle you're inside of. Um, you can refer to yourself. You can also refer to the top level frame on this page. And then within this frame, you have access to sort of various different pieces and visual elements, different kinds of buttons and password fields and things like this. So you can use this to sort of manipulate what is actually drawn on the screen. Okay. So what we want to look at now is, you know, what are some of the security threats for browsers? Like, uh, you know, what makes this an interesting problem? So suppose we have some simple HTML like this, image source equals Bucky, or some height, it displays an image. So this seems fairly innocuous, right? Because all it's doing is displaying an image. So is there some way we can use this ability um, to display an image to attack a computer system? Um, and of course, you know the answer is yes, because this is a security class, and we know that everything is insecure. Okay. So one of the things you can do is you can add some JavaScript code that will sort of measure how long does it take to load something. So here we are trying to load an image. We have a little bit of JavaScript that will refer to this image element named test. You can see at the top we're defining this image. Um, and we are going to uh, measure when uh, we start loading it. We're then going to have another function that will get executed if there's an error loading it, and it'll print out the total time that it took to load it. And then at the bottom, we have some source file here. So what this will do is sort of if we fail to load, it'll print up a pop-up of like how long we spent trying to load this thing. So how, we, how might we use code that can detect or measure how long uh, loading an image takes? So one way is, you know, I'm a legitimate developer. I want to know, does my page load quickly? Are there errors in the page? This will let me know on a web page, did all my images load quickly or not? But if I'm malicious, then what I want to think about is, what are the targets? Where, what URLs can I provide for this image that let me do something interesting? So suppose there's a scenario where there's a browser that is talking to a server that's behind a firewall. Right, so if you've worked at any company, this will be the example. Well, there's a, the browser behind the firewall. So you are at your desk, or even at the university, you're at your desk, you are connecting through a firewall to the internet, you talk to some server, you know, the server will tell you, here is some image you could, you could send. Now, what happens if the server gives you an IP address that is a local IP address inside the firewall? 
and not a global IP address on the internet, right? You normally expect the content in your web page to come from the internet itself, not from your local area network. But your browser doesn't really know that, so your browser is just going to say, oh, you know, um, it's going to uh, sort of display whatever is passed down. So if you go to some attacker web page, they'll give you a page full of HTML. In that HTML, they can list lots of internal addresses, and then they can see the response from this of how long the, the server can now see the response of that timing and see how long did it take to fetch this information. So how might you use this? Well, one way to use it is you can use this to sort of figure out what servers are running locally. So you can see if I give you an address, is there something running there or is that not an address? So I can map your internal network. I can potentially connect to different ports because remember I can put a port number in the URL. So I can do a port scan of internal systems at your location. I can potentially fetch documents from some internal location and get information about it. Um, and so, you know, I can figure out if I fetch some known URL, it might let me know, is this a known piece of software um, that, you know, only certain software provides. So I can use this to sort of uh, do reconnaissance on your internal network to figure out what's happening by just telling your browser to fetch images or other content from your internal network. So this is sort of a problem with browsers, right? They don't have a sense of, you know, what things they should allow happen and what things they shouldn't allow to have happen. Any questions? Yes? Um, it doesn't necessarily, but remember that when you connect to a web server, you will provide what browser you're running. And so you can often tell what operating system that computer is running when you connect. But really, you're just sort of doing some kind of random scan. You can really this could just be some kind of random scan. But if you know, you know, what you sort of want to do is say, I know sort of signatures, particular URLs I can fetch that will tell me about what's running. Um, you know, if I fetch this URL from a Cisco firewall, I'll get this response back. And so if you do that, you can sort of learn about what's happening. And remember, when you fetch things, um, they're put into the DOM, and then the script code that is running can access those things that were fetched today. And sort of look at the internal documents that you're able to download. Other questions? Okay, so we see an example attack. So now we want to think about what do we what does browser security mean here? What do we want to have happen? So we think at a nice at some level we can't trust humans, right? Humans are terrible for security. You know, if I send you a URL through email, there's a good chance you will click on any email that comes through me. If I say, you know, new, here's a copy of the exam from last year and I give you a URL, I bet every one of you would click on that link, right? And I could subvert your computer. And that shouldn't be impossible, right? I, you should be able to get any link through email and click on it and not have your security compromised. And it's not true, but that is sort of the goal that we want. We should be safe to open two different websites at the same time and have them not interfere with each other. So if I visit, um, you know, Google.com and Facebook.com, Google shouldn't be able to spy on Facebook, on my interactions with Facebook. Those two should be separated somehow. Furthermore, if I have a web page and, you know, I have my web page and I want to put a Google Calendar widget on my web page to kind of show my schedule, that Google Calendar widget shouldn't be able to sort of see everything else on my web page. It should be able to control what it's displaying, but it shouldn't see anything else. So these are the kinds of policies that we want. So when we think about this, we can sort of think about this as a standard operating system isolation problem. So we've got a browser, it's running, taking untrusted inputs and executing them the same way your operating system might take programs from untrusted users and run them, right? As a normal user in an operating system, you can run any program you want. The operating system lets you run it, but it tries to protect other users from the damage that you do. Um, so that a browser has to do that with the attacker web page. Um, now, there's a couple of problems. One is browsers are big and complex. They are sort of similar in complexity and size to operating systems at this point in some ways. Millions of lines of code. And so it means that if there's a bug in a browser, so there will be bugs in browsers, and so we need to think about 
Uh, how do we make sure if there are bugs that they don't have bad consequences? Um, and <coughs> it also means that because browsers are ubiquitous and people use them all the time, that they're very vulnerable. That it's very, you know, it's relatively easy if you find a bug in a browser to find some way to exploit it, whether it be sending somebody a URL or buying an ad on web pages that will display some content for you. Furthermore, um, and the trend is a little bit less because HTML is getting better, but it's often that we want to embed fancy things on our web page. We want to have videos that play. You know, it used to be people embed flash videos. Now you can do more and more through HTML. Um, but there is this sense that we want to sort of be able to embed other kinds of objects on our web page that are not just HTML or JavaScript. And so we have other programming models that we're embedding. Like you want to display a PDF embedded on your web page. Well, now you have to have a PDF viewer. That PDF viewer might have bugs in its rendering system that can compromise you. So what this means is that we have a problem that some malicious website can compromise your browser. From there, it can potentially compromise other websites that you're talking to or your interaction with them and potentially compromise your operating system from there. So that's why we sort of care about this problem so much. So a thing to note here that's really important is that there's sort of two classes of problems here. One is you've got different windows and tabs that are all separate content, all separate interactions where we want them to be fairly separate most of the time. But on a single web page, we're going to have content from lots of different sources. So we need to think about on a web page, who has access to all the information that makes up that page, right? Every page has this DOM tree that des describes everything. And we have to decide which elements get access to which pieces of that tree. So for example, if I embed a Google Calendar on my web page, should my code on my web page be able to sort of see and overwrite and interact with that Google Calendar code? Should the Google Calendar code get to sort of see and interact with my code that is on the page surrounding it? So, you know, there's actually quite a few of these. If you look at an average web page now, there's something like 70 or 80 different things that get downloaded to render it from 20 or 30 different locations, right? So there's content from lots of different places, and it's mostly ads at this point in ad tracking services, right? So a web page might have content from a dozen or more different ad networks that are trying to track what you're doing and sell it. Uh, so we're going to stop shortly, but the thing to think about is we are security systems people. We want to build a more secure browser. The thing we want to provide is isolation. We want to isolate components from each other so they can't interact um, unless we say they can interact. So we need to figure out what are the entities here? What are the subjects of access control? In a normal operating system, users are sort of the subjects or the programs we're running are the subjects because we're deciding should this program have access. The objects in an operating system are things like files and system calls. So we have to figure out for a browser, what are the objects? What are the resources that we want to protect? And these will be portions of the DOM tree, the ability to communicate over the network, the ability to communicate with other web pages that are running. And then one of the hardest things is the policies. What should we allow? What should we disallow? And it turns out that a lot of the research here isn't on how do you provide isolation. It's how do you decide what should be isolated from other things. So we sort of have a parallel here between operating systems with processes and system calls and browsers where we have um, sort of document object model, frames, local storage, similar to file storage. We have principles. And in browsers, the way we think about principles is, is people have settled on an origin as a principle which means that we are going to look at the website and the protocol and the port number that a request came from, and we're going to pretend that is the, that is the entity making access. So if you go to www.amazon.com on port 80, then we are going to say that is, in effect, Amazon is a user in your browser, and Amazon can share information with itself, so multiple Amazon pages can share, but you know we want to isolate it from pages that don't start with www.amazon.com. Um, so I think we will stop here because we're going to sort of dive into this model more next time. Um, so you have a couple extra minutes back in your life. Please take cookies on your way out. I don't want to take them back and feed them to grad students. They don't deserve them. Unless you're a grad student here and then you do. So inside the browser, we need a data structure to represent 
the web page you downloaded. And this data structure has been standardized as what's called the document object model. And it really is a tree structure that represents everything you downloaded, right? So when you download HTML, you've got some kind of document. Within that document, you have headers. Um, underneath that, you have different elements like titles, links, things like that. So this document object model represents sort of the result of parsing everything that you downloaded in that web page into a tree. Um, and then what JavaScript code can do is sort of manipulate this tree. It can read things out of the tree. It can modify elements in the tree. It can add new elements into the tree. Um, so there are standard methods to sort of, you know, find, uh, refer to a specific form or a link. So you can have names attached to different elements and you can use JavaScript code to refer to these things. Um, so, you know, you can also refer to high level things. So like HTTP had a referring URL. And so you can refer to that with document.refer to sort of get the address of whoever referred you to this web page. 